how has your artistic practice changed as a result of your uh, inhabiting more fully this idea of being a citizen artist? I would just say it, it, it is the honor of my life. I mean, I, I love that you keep coming back to that. It's such a privilege and it's a through line now that, you know, I still have plenty of cognitive dissonance in my daily goings on, but, but there's, there is this sense that I am using my art as a delivery system for hope. And you know, I think, Eric, to come back to something you mentioned initially, um, that how much the word soul came up in these videos, I think we are going to be hard pressed to really address the education crisis in this country, to really address our lack of social cohesion, our you know, defunct healthcare system, if we don't address the soul. And I know that is just very sort of unscientific and wrong to sort of mention that, but the truth is, whatever you want to call it, you know, collective unconscious or God or whatever, we have to address it. And this is art's currency. You know, I, th I love uh, the fact that the Latin root spiritum is the core of both respiration, my instrument, all of our instrument really, and inspiration. So when we breathe together, when we hear a work of art together, and we sing together, and we paint together, what happens, whether or not we realize, is that we start to breathe. I actually noticed when, at the beginning when Eric said, look to your neighbor, there was an audible <sighs> in this room. So I think you know, if we don't go on that level, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be very tough for us to address these challenges. So I think, again, the opportunity to see the arts as a solution to our crises. Um, this is a new idea. It, again, it's not. It wasn't. It wasn't what was mentioned when I was in art school. You know, um, but it is. That's sort of the joy and the discovery of my life, and the fact that the arts are increasingly being invited to the table, thanks to people like Damien and thanks to the Aspen Institute, um, the inclusion of arts in policy making gatherings. You know, this is new. It's not an accident that the arts have been cut out of schools. It's because we weren't at the table there for a couple decades. So we're elbowing our way back in. And I think what's so amazing about Street Symphony is you're doing it literally on the streets. That's what the pianos do. 450 times over, we have placed these pianos in the middle of you know, everywhere from Coney Island to the Bronx Grand Concourse and said, this is yours. You are a creator. You have a creative spark. Everyone does. Excavate that. And I think that really is the beginning of a lot of, a lot of healing for, for us. EJ, for you and your, your practice, how has right. it changed? So, um, you know, I actually want to approach this from almost like a technical musical angle about what has changed in the way that I actually play my instrument myself, which is that, you know, we as young musicians are fed a kind of myth <coughs> that either you're going to become Yo-Yo Ma or you'll be nothing. And, and this, this is a cause of immense trauma for us. That we, we have to either become soloists and to join a great orchestra like the LA Phil is already a kind of, you've kind of already failed, right? And those who can't do teach and those who can't teach do outreach, yeah. right? And so, and so we, we kind of build this kind of stigma of hierarchy um, around how we approach being an artist. And I think what this work has actually allowed me to do in my own playing, quite simply, is breathe and relax. Where I've actually started to realize I don't have to do this alone. I don't have to be perfect. I was recently invited to give the opening keynote for the League of American Orchestras conference in Chicago last week, and Yo-Yo gave the final the talk there. And he said the, only, the first time he actually questioned why he played the cello was when he was 49 years old. Right? Because we've been imbued with this idea of perfection as this brittle standard that often belongs to somebody else. Right? So this work has immensely humbled me as a musician because you know, we have a, a, a mentor named Liz Lerman who did this work about 30 years ago with dance. And she wrote an incredible book called Hiking the Horizontal. And she takes that stigma of hierarchy and lays it on its side, lays it on the, on the horizontal. And what emerges from that place is an equanimity of excellence, right? Who are we to say that our excellence should be more worthy than the excellence of someone like Brian or Christina who are recovering from homelessness and addiction? Right? Why aren't their voices as central to the table? What do we have to learn from them? So we've created this kind of exchange. And you know, we'll come back to this in a story later on, but we actually took a Schumann string quartet into Twin Towers Jail in downtown LA, which is effectively the largest psychiatric institution on the planet. Our de facto treatment of mental illness in the United States is incarceration. 
and we were playing a piece by a man who we would probably diagnose as, ha as having schizoaffective disorder. And an inmate in the jail said, you know, man, Schumann died in a place like this. And it hadn't even clicked in our mind. And so in that moment, it completely changed the way we played in the jail. And then the next week when my quartet played that piece on stage at Disney Hall, I gave the introduction to the audience at Disney Hall saying this story. So that they could hear it in a completely different way. Absolutely. And we played it in a different way. And we weren't shaking with nervousness because we were carrying the story of those 80 men we played for in Twin Towers Jail with us to the stage. So this is coming back to our role as, as citizens.